Today I have Sabina Al Khair with me. Sabina Al Khair is a well known um, professor in Oxford. She's at the Oxford uh, Poverty and Human Resources Humanity Institute. And she's done a lot of work on multidimensional poverty, and lots of people know of her work. So she's uh, kindly wanted to be on the Pied um, you know, video forum. Sabina, I just want to uh, Sabina, I just want to check uh, and talk to you about uh, as everybody else in the world is talking about the COVID crisis. Now you've been working a lot, and uh, you know poverty very well. Um, obviously, COVID is going to have a deep impact. I mean, and if it's talking about a minus three percent growth, probably the first time in history. Um, and what you said is exactly the concern: is that at the same time that we have a COVID a health pandemic, which is going to strike people at all levels of the distribution of, of the spectrum. There's also um, a coming recession, which will strike probably the informal workers um, and the less protected sectors of society more harshly. And so I think we have to keep in mind both of these aspects when evaluating the response to COVID. Um, we, in OFI, um, on the one hand, have been very much admiring and, and understanding Pakistan's National Multidimensional Poverty Index that it launched in 2016 using the PSM data from 2014-15, which found around 38.8% of people were poor and went down to the district level and showed a huge variation in levels of poverty. And in the global MPI, which is a different measure than Pakistan's MPI and more acute, um, we do have figures from 2017-18, which also show you know, that around 38% of people are multidimensionally poor, but that varies from 11% in Islamabad to 25% in Punjab, over 50% in Sindh and KPK, 65 in Balochistan, or 71 in Fatah. And so I think thinking about COVID alongside the lives of poor men, women, and children um, brings the situation into a different relief. So that's one angle of, of exploration that we have tried to do. And a second has been to try to understand how COVID is making new groups of people vulnerable. So the numbers that I just mentioned now are poverty numbers, but we've also tried to explore new vulnerabilities. For example, um, if we simply think of people who use in the 2017-18 data, which are the most recent we have access to because the PSLM is still in the field, um, which would be the better data source for national uh, work. Um, but according to them, if we just look at people who are, have evidence of nutrition, malnutrition in their households, don't have clean drinking water, and don't have um, a clean source of cooking fuel, so are at risk of acute respiratory infections, the people who are deprived in all three of those at the same time, we consider high risk. And it ranges from 21,000 in Islamabad to 3.8 million in Sindh. And it's much higher in Sindh than in Punjab, where it's only 1.5 million people. And so these new vulnerabilities bring our eyes to new groups. And also, similarly, using the 2014-15 um, PSLM data set, UNDP, extended Pakistan's National Multidimensional Poverty Index to include new dimensions of vulnerability. So they made a multidimensional vulnerability index and they found that around 57% of people, not 38 or 39, were poor by a vulnerability index. And that the vulnerability increased actually in urban areas, for example, uh, for informal workers, for people who don't have any possibility of uh, grain stores. Um, and so live on the edge, and people where there's a high density of crowding, and so social distancing both within their home and more widely is, is severely impaired. And so in thinking about the COVID response, one has to think about its response in terms of containing a pandemic that is deadly and that has to be contained with decisive action, and I would salute um, the activities towards that. And I salute the ASAS program and different that have tried to bring immediate response to vulnerable people. But there's also a need to think about the lives of poor people who might die of other causes. Um, and so I think 
trying to keep these both both of these difficult situations in mind together um, is in a sense our our interest as a group that works on poverty. Mm -hmm. Tell me, the government has responded to the situation, <clears throat> but as you said, obviously the poor country and uh, uh, reach of the government is limited, especially when we are in the middle of a farm program and we have a death situation that is worrisome. Uh, but the government has tried to respond. I mean, how do you see that response? And do you think that there should be, I, I mean, I'm particularly thinking of something else. I'm thinking, can we be more innovative um, than just giving out cash? Is there anything that we could do? Or is the only alternative to hand out cash? Because that means that if you hand out cash, by definition, we'll have to head towards more inflation, which will also cut back on the ability of the poor to look after themselves. So are we caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, or do we have an, an, another option available? I think that's exactly the right question to ask, of course. Um, but no, it's, it's very serious, because as you said, if the government is in debt, if it's then giving out cash, and then there's a food price spike, then you're going more deeply into debt, but the impact on poor people's lives is, is being reduced because of uh, food price inflation. And so that would augur for alternative strategies. For example, um, direct delivery of grains where they are essentially procured and then delivered. It could be labor intensive, but perhaps with um, a combination of volunteer groups and um, some institutionalized groups in the UK, we've used military, um, we've used other, other groups, volunteers and gotten thousands of them. Um, but trying to find other ways of actually delivering things to the doorstep of the most vulnerable groups. Um, that would be an al alternative way where at least the inflation cost would be contained, but then the transaction cost might be higher for some. Um, and so that could be used in, in cases where, for example, poor people don't have access to a bank or their long queues um, or the, the, the procurement is difficult uh, for other reasons. And at the same time, price controls may need to be applied quite quite stringently. Sure. The thing that our Prime Minister has been struggling with, I'll put that to you, our Prime Minister has repeatedly come on television and, and, and expressed this thing that, hey, if we lock down the country, as is the custom now, everybody locking down the country, and we did lock down the country for two weeks, and we are right now in a semi-lockdown. But his point was that if you lock down the country, we hurt the vulnerable the most especially the owners and the people who have some recourse to funding for themselves. And he said that one of the reasons that he's against a full lockdown and one of the reasons he's returned some activity back to the country is because he said, hey, we can't possibly um, look after these people in their entirety and uh, we, we should open up the lockdown. So I, I, let me ask you this, thinking about it, that, hey, this is like doing a countrywide risk analysis, which we do. We do take risk, more kind of risk that we take. So if you look at it from risk mitigation or risk management strategy, um, what is the choice between a lockdown and not a lockdown? And for example, should we allow, we've got a young population, um, should we allow COVID to go through, as Boris Johnson said, and achieve herd immunity, or should we go for a full lockdown and uh, and quite possibly, there's also the theory that lockdown could be rich and anti poor. So, how do you see this situation? I think the the reality is that none of us know, and hindsight will be much richer than what we have now. Um, it seems that the arguments against lockdown um, are valid if it is actually impossible um, to deliver um, survival based needs to the vulnerable groups because clearly the COVID statistics only count deaths that are um, in hospital usually, and that are counted as COVID deaths, but there might be other starvation deaths or food uh, related um, deaths, which would be tragic. And yet what we are trying to mitigate is the human cost, which includes both the COVID uh, cost and, and the cost of, of poverty and containment. And so the risk strategy is really trying to look at both of those and make some predictions about how both of them go and where is where's the optimal point which is a, a difficult task um, but the herd immunity seems like it will definitely have very large costs um, to the elders of the communities um, and also young people are by no means um, immune 
And so I think there was a brief time in the government of the UK where herd immunity was spoken of, but I think that now that is very much seen slightly as a misstep because um, it led to this spurt in cases um, that, and we do not know if, if people will be immune or if they reinfect. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty there. So I think some containment is, is wise, but really trying to understand and obtain information about those who are finding other non-COVID related poverty costs very, very sharp. And I don't know the best way of obtaining information in terms of um, mobile phone surveys, in terms of other kinds of information collection, but that seems to be very essential. Uh, I'm towards looking beyond COVID. I mean, okay, like all things, I hope, I hope COVID will also end and I hope humans will achieve some kind of immunity or vaccine or some cure. So let's say uh, sort of the IMF is right and that next year will probably be better, although it will probably not be a sharp recovery, but there could be a shallow recovery starting somewhere around next year. So if, if we expect that, there are first, there are a number of things the way we do business probably will change. What do you anticipate and what should a poor country like Pakistan expect in terms of the changes that will take place in global practice in global uh, the way we do business? And uh, the next thing also related to that is our export demand. Will our export demand pick up sharply or slowly? How do we um, think on those lines? Mm. Yes. Um. The hope could be that um, although COVID will have a terrible impact in the short term, probably, although we still hope maybe not so much, but it certainly could, the hope would be that it would mobilize a kind of solidarity across classes and sectors of the society. That may sound naive, and yet one does see it in some places in evidence where people are very much volunteering, where charitable donations are coming in, um, where there is a, a recognition and celebration of the uh, frontline workers as in Sakar, you know, recognizing the, the health workers. Uh, and, and if that kind of solidarity were to evolve into a clear historic shift in the well-being of the poor, it would be a definite gain. We think in the UK of how during World War II, with the food rations, life expectancy actually increased. Um, and it, it's unexpected that, that, that out of a tragic situation, there could be some lifting of the bottom of the distribution. But I guess that that would be the genuine hope is that this would be, there's such a, a, a mix up of, of the whole society at this time, but that the recovery phase would just simply permanently lift the bottom of the distribution and and to to a new level. And so the kinds of acute poverty that now are exper experienced would not be in the future. And that would require really thinking ahead and bringing in social protection programs because there will be, you know, monies for recovery, maybe never enough. And there's a real need for more money in Pakistan now. Um, but when those monies are invested, if they are invested with an eye towards a long-term permanent shift, then it really could be a decisive moment. And one, uh, somebody who's worked on Pakistan since my doctoral work and poverty and women's income generation since then, it would just be such a joy to see um, just that kind of a, a wise historic shift happening. I think the danger is that um, it, those best protected from the shocks then would re repair their own lives, but perhaps without the investment to other groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me ask you, Again, looking beyond COVID, and given your long experience of work with Pakistan, your familiarity with it, how would you expect, or how would you advise, it, not expect, how would you advise us to change our policies so that we can really, really achieve the growth, the growth that you want, that I want, that all of us want? So, what are the key changes in policies that you recommend? beyond COVID. This is a chance for us to rethink, a chance for us to try and do something different. So what is it that you'd like for us to be different? I mean, I'm a student for life of, of different country systems and what has worked. And 
everyone it, it does it differently, but we are the network, the, the secretariat of a 60 country South-South network and Pakistan is a part of it that share their lessons. And I would, I think that there are three things that I would love um, to be part of the new uh, approach. One is um, greater coordination. So for example, in Colombia where President Santos uh, took poverty as well as conflict as his um, critically important policy areas when he became uh, president in 2011. Um, and he made a huge reduction in 2010. He made a huge reduction in multidimensional poverty during his term of office, reducing it by one third. Um, but that was by having a round table that he himself chaired. Every minister had to be present. They couldn't be absent. He would ask the minister, what's happened to your indicator? What's happened to your indicator? The ministers came in competing with each other, but he said, look, when it comes to poverty, it's a team sport. What the minister of health does affects what the minister of education can do, what water and transportation do affect them as well. And so we have to push this ball down the field working together. And it was quite difficult to get that cooperation. But then when it, it locked in, Every year they used the MPI as a management tool. They saw what indicators had not moved using a very simplistic dashboard uh, stoplight. And then they had alerts and acceleration measures to reduce poverty. And that, that occurred. And it was a function of political leadership and coordination across sectors. Um, a second is um, that the private sector is often um, not knowing how to engage. Um, we've spun off Oxford's first social enterprise, and it's because in Costa Rica, the private sector were saying, what can we do to reduce poverty in our country? And what they did was they began to use their national MPI on their own employee base. And Bach, the biggest bank in Costa Rica, did it first. And they had the CEO fill out the poverty form survey, and then the staff did it voluntarily. And they found that well, 14% of people in Costa Rica were poor, in their own bank, it was 12%, which was a shock. And these were people you know, who were not just the cleaners, but up to middle management, but it was because they were caring for both sets of parents or their children were unemployed. And so the private sector came in first among their employee base to do their part, but aiming at the same goal, which was national multidimensional poverty reduction. And now some of the co corporations have gone into the value chains, not their own employees. And I think Pakistan has vibrant and you know, educated and active private sector, and somehow getting them to align and, and work towards this goal could be innovative. Um, and then the other natural is just in terms of public expenditure priorities, that um, where it is spent, spent in a gender equitable way, spent in a, a way that is, is blind to other divisions, but really has the well-being of, of the poor as, as the guide of the budget. I think that that's evident and yet it still needs to be said i think thank you sabina thank you very much let me just end by saying that uh, you've always been very kind to pakistan and i would invite you whenever you come to pakistan regard the pride of your home uh, you should come and visit us you should come and stay with us you should come and uh, guide our researchers in fact i think we already have you on our advisory board we would welcome all the help you can give because pakistan research needs help from you and we certainly need to address these issues in the coming, coming years. We have to create a new world where we seek your guidance again. So thank mm -hmm. you very much for giving us your time. All thank you best. so much. And I have so much re respect and regard for the research sector in Pakistan. It's fantastic. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>